Hey everyone, how goes it? Laszlo Montgomery here with the exciting conclusion to the once-over we're giving to the controversial life of Dai Li. We left off in part two with Dai suffering a crushing setback after uncovering a communist spy ring in the most sensitive part of his intelligence empire. In March 1940, he learned of its existence, and after he plugged that massive hole in his MSB, or Military Investigation and Statistics Bureau, he was determined to never let that happen again. The head office of the MSB was located in the south of Chongqing, in a district called Guanglongman. This was a name that ran a chill up and down the spine of anyone familiar with the goings-on in that place. As the 1940s dawned, Dai Li's MSB was running a whole constellation of concentration camps around China that housed all manners of enemies of the state. And that was a pretty wide umbrella in the early 1940s, and it's unknown how many people ended up inside one of those things. In these prison camps, those who had been unfortunate enough to have been rounded up went through a harsh regimen of brainwashing. It was actually common for many of those who were fully indoctrinated in these prisons to later go on to serve the Jintong, the MSB, as part of the organization. Once the MSB had been established in 1938, what began was an eight-year reign of terror in nationalist China, produced and directed by Dai Li. MSB death squads were some of the busiest people in China. Not only did they carry out various kinds of liquidation measures of human beings, disposing of the remains of their gruesome handiwork was also part of their job description. Some of the methods are... Too gruesome to recount here, you know, this being a family program and all. After being schooled by the likes of Yen Bao Hang and Zhang Lu Ping, Dai became more ruthless than ever. Anyone whose orbit circled Dai Li had to be sure to never step out of line. His rule book contained a lot of restrictions. He even forbade his people working for him to marry. For men, he didn't want their attention to the mission at hand distracted by a woman. There were three punishments that he meted out that everyone needed to be wary of. If you didn't follow your orders correctly, you got a serious tongue lashing. If your infraction warranted it in Dai Li's eyes, you got thrown in prison. And for more egregious lapses in judgment or mistakes, you got death by firing squad. Besides those two high-profile infiltrations, Dai Li was still smarting from the botched assassination attempt on Wang Jingwei on March 21, 1939. Dai Li's agents followed Wang to Hanoi after he fled Chongqing. Jin Tong assassins tried to kill him one night. They broke into his hotel room and emptied their submachine guns before they scattered. They thought for sure they killed him, but Wang survived. He did get shot in the melee, but... Because he had switched rooms with his assistant, it was the assistant's room that the assassins did the most damage. Dai Li, Chen Li Fu, Chen Guo Fu, Jiang Kai Shek, everyone denied they had anything to do with the attempt on Wang Jingwei's life. But all roads led to Jiang. Wang was his political nemesis in the party, and always had been. Jiang himself would never have carried out such an act. So the whole attempt on Wang's life was masterminded by Dai on his behalf, and it didn't go as planned. Soon afterwards, Wang Jingwei will make the fateful decision to throw his lot in with the Japanese and collaborate with them to form a rival government to Jiang's. Wang will much later end up dying from complications of his wounds in Nagoya in November 1944. Dai may have imposed almost puritanical standards on the people who worked for him. But as for himself, well, he had acquired quite a reputation. He had MSB safe houses all over Chongqing, where he would engage in various liaisons with women he desired. Even the girlfriends or sisters of his own officers in the MSB, even they weren't safe. Whatever he wanted, well, who was going to tell someone like Dai Li? No. He was involved with quite a few notable women of the day, Kawashima Yoshiko, for one. Remember her from the CHP three-part series I did of this mysterious and tragic Manchurian princess? He had a thing for her. And one of Dai Li's love interests during this Chongqing period was Hu Die. Her English name was Butterfly Wu. 
She was, well, if not the hottest actress appearing in Chinese movies, she certainly was one of the biggest names at the time. She wandered into Chongqing in late 1943. Though still married at the time, she was introduced to Dai Li and became his mistress. And over the next three years, they carried out a torrid love affair. There were others as well, but perhaps Dai Li's highest profile love interest was Chen Hua. Not only was she Dai Li's leading lady, he recruited her as a spy, and she was credited with providing Dai with all kinds of assistance inside the MSB. We'll come back to her later on. She shows up again at the end of Dai Li's life. Well, as I mentioned, Dai Li finally got his chance to latch on to the Americans and use this new relationship to bring his powers in China to their greatest height. Let me introduce the main character for this next chapter in Dai Li's story. This was Vice Admiral Milton Edward Miles. He was popularly known as Mary Miles, a nickname given to him by his fellow cadets at the Naval Academy. This came from Mary Miles Minter, a Hollywood film star from the Silent Days. She got her star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame right by the uh, Capitol Records building. Milton Miles got his first look at China between 1922 to 1927 when he was assigned to the U.S. Navy's Yangtze River Patrol. He served in the Navy's Asiatic Section, 1935 to 1939. From 1942 to 43, Miles was a U.S. Navy observer, based in the China wartime capital of Chongqing. Anyway, Miles had worked his way up to the head of naval intelligence operations in China, and surely he knew who Dai Li was. Let me mention that by 1942, so many people surrounding Chiang Kai-shek were practically screaming in his ear about Dai Li. Through his ham-fisted manners in which he ran his agents and his aggressive behavior in hunting down traitors, even Madame Jiang and her brother T.V. Song were demanding Jiang rein in his spy and secret police chief. This stage of his life, early 1942, this really was the low point of Dai Li's career. He had managed to piss everyone off, and had made too many influential enemies with access to his boss, the Generalissimo. His MSB had been infiltrated on a number of occasions. The Chen brothers, Guo Fu and Li Fu, they were always looking to trip him up and compete with Dai Li wherever their jurisdictions overlapped. I mentioned Dai had something against the British. There were a set of incidents that led Dai to cross swords with British intelligence Then he sort of went beyond his authority to try and expel them from China. Not anyone ever to be taken lightly. The British officers in China retaliated with a massive anti-Dai Li campaign, spreading around unsavory propaganda that put Dai in a bad light. And because the Songs were close to the Brits, well, they saw this as an opportunity for them, too, to push back against Dai's ambitions. And so Chiang Kai-shek did what he had to do. He clipped Dai's wings. In July 1942, Jiang told Dai from now on he's only to work with the Americans and to stay away from all other foreign intel organizations. This cut out a big chunk of Dai's empire that he had been slowly building up since the mid-1930s. It was a huge come down for Dai. But as it often is, sometimes for me and for you, when one door closes... Another door opens, and for Dai Li, this is exactly what happened. Once the date that lives in infamy happened on December 7, 1941, America's military and intelligence personnel continued to pour into Chongqing. And with this, Dai Li saw mountains of opportunity from this interesting change in the dynamic. He had one slight problem, however, and as it had been worked out between Jiang and the Songs, The primary China government contact for the Americans was TV Song. And TV and Dai Li were no longer on good terms. Dai had to go through TV to get to the Americans. And that was his first nut to crack. Ever since Japan allied itself with Germany in late August 1939, Stalin had to cool it with the Soviet assistance to Chiang Kai-shek. And without the brilliance of the Comintern helping out, This put a major crimp in the counterintelligence operations. This was also when the 
Zhang Luping's spy network affair was just starting. In December 1943, the legendary head of the OSS, Wild Bill Donovan, arrived in Chongqing on his first visit there. Dai Li had a lot of beefs with the OSS in China, but most of all, he objected to their independence from his oversight and control. He didn't like them going around spying on everything and gathering intel where he wasn't directing things or had his own people working with them on the inside. One other thing that irked Dai Li was that the OSS, the Office of Strategic Services, forerunner to the CIA, well, since its formation in June 1942, Donovan had regularly engaged the services of British secret agents. And you know how Dai felt about them. So a lot of friction was already chafing Dai Li when he met Wild Bill for the first time. They had openly threatened each other in their heated arguments. Unlike Donovan, Milton Miles, for his own reasons, was very hot to work with Dai Li. He felt, based on his observations and thinking this all out, that Dai was the man the Americans needed to work with. And this, at first, vague notion about joining hands and sharing resources in the common goal of defeating Japan was what later led to Seiko. The more pressure the Americans put on Japan in China, the less resources Japan could dedicate to fighting the war in the Pacific. When Miles returned to Chongqing after a trip to the U.S. in April 1942, Dai Li's agents surveilled him 24 hours a day, Maintaining this full-court press and learning every single aspect about how Miles thought and spoon-feeding him only what Dai wanted him to know, well, the relationship grew close very fast. And as they got to know each other and exchanged ideas, Milton, Mary Miles, and Dai Li gradually shook hands on the idea of what became known as the Sino-American Cooperative Organization, better known as SACO. Dai Li had proposed to Miles, quote, I would like to have you arm 50,000 of my guerrillas and train them to fight the Japanese. The United States wants many things in China, weather reports from the north and west to guide your planes and ships at sea, information about Japanese intentions and operations, mines in our channels and harbors, ship watchers on our coast, and radio stations to send this information. I have 50,000 good men, they had been chosen from among those who had most reason to hate the Japanese invader. But they are armed only with what they've been able to make or capture, and most of them are almost untrained. But if we are able to give you all you ask for, your operations will need to be protected, and you cannot bring in enough men for that. So if my men could be armed and trained, they could not only protect your operations, but could work for China, too. End quote. Miles mulled this over, and discussions about setting up a U.S.-trained Chinese-operated guerrilla force continued until the end of 1942, when all that remained to be hammered out was the fine print. And on the last day of the year, an agreement was signed, witnessed by T.V. Song himself, that created Seiko. And no small number of eyebrows were raised when Dai Li was named the head of the organization. Milton Miles served in the number two spot as his deputy. Although Dai was ranked higher, they both had equal veto power, so no one could operate independently of the other. Though, of course, with such authority as this, the final document left Dai with plenty of wiggle room to use the resources of Seiko for operations not necessarily focused on fighting Japan. Not a bad comeback for Dai Li. 1942 had started off poorly for Dai, but he managed to finish off the year on a high note. In January 1943, the agreement signed in Chongqing was sent to Washington for final approval. And on April 15th, 1943, it was official, and everyone from FDR down the chain of command signed off on it. Not everyone was cool with funding this whole organization and allowing Dai Li, or any Chinese national, to be the number one. There was a lot of pushback at the top about this. Some believed it left the door wide open for all manners of abuses. <laughs> if they only knew. Not wasting a moment of time, Dai Li gave Miles a wish list of everything he wanted to start training and arming this new guerrilla force. 
and Dai Li was grinning from ear to ear as soon as Uncle Sam turned on those spigots and the aid started to flow. Speaking of Dai Li's grin, Milton Miles later said of Dai, upon meeting him for the first time, quote, He was a white-faced man, rather flat nose, lots of gold teeth in front of his mouth. I found out later he had his teeth knocked down his throat by the communists in South China, and he had them put back in, in gold. He had dark black hair and wide set eyes. I found out that he was a ruthless man. End quote. Well, under this new arrangement, Dai Li was on top of the world. This was a major coup for him, and everyone knew he was the top guy in this new U.S. backed organization. Miles, in retrospect, put a little bit too much trust and faith in Dai Li. Milton Miles was no dummy. He was a seasoned professional, but he was no match for Dai's cunning and how he so easily played Miles and all the Americans like a fiddle. In front of his Chinese colleagues, Dai never wanted to appear as someone subservient to the Yanks. Quoting from Frederick Wakeman's spy master, quote, Dai Li did have to maintain a certain distance from the Americans, lest he be identified as their running dog. Hence, from the formation of Seiko on, the Jintong chief made certain that he actually retained the upper hand while offering Miles the formal illusion of leadership without substantial control over the field activities of the guerrilla units that the Americans worked so hard to train, arm, and deploy. End quote. Over the next few years of its existence, about 2,500 Americans, mostly Navy men, did tours of China with Seiko. And everyone in on the main mission knew the paramount task was to train these 50,000 guerrillas to carry out all kinds of black ops and intel gathering work to disrupt the Japanese anytime, anywhere. There were 14 Seiko branches around China involved in the training of Dai Li's men. The Americans taught them all the deadly skills that they had in their arsenal. As far as Seiko's mission was concerned, they were tasked to take care of four main things. They had to man the coast and seek out any Japanese vessels so that the Navy could attempt to sink or harass the Japanese Navy. They also provided intel on Japanese supply depots and any building or structure that was of any use to the Japanese in carrying out their war efforts. And once they were spotted, they were blown up. Anything and everything that could cause inconvenience or hardship to the Japanese, Seiko agents did it. They also provided weather reports that assisted American pilots in bombing Japanese targets, including on the Chinese mainland. And of course, there was the training of these guerrilla fighters and teaching them how to gather useful intel. Let me quote from Wakeman again. Quote, However dubious these assertions, Seiko's American personnel regarded their mission in China as primarily a guerrilla training effort that would eventually create a Maquis-like resistance force to attack the Japanese from the rear when regular U.S. units finally landed on the China coast. Examination of each of the Seiko units ultimately belies the claims of enemy casualties inflicted, but it certainly does not belittle the heroism of the Americans who volunteered for this assignment and who look back upon their wartime experience with pride and fondness for the men who served under them. Since almost none of the Americans knew much about China, or even spoke the most rudimentary Chinese, their misunderstanding of the situation was at times grotesque. It's fair to say, I believe, that some were shocked or incredulous to learn later that they had been identified with units that trained the most horrendous of the nationalist regime's secret police units, charged with the persecution, including the kidnapping, torture, and killing of progressive elements throughout Free China during the years that Seiko flourished. End quote. Variations of this theme would happen again and again in America's overseas adventures, in Vietnam, Iraq, Afghanistan, and of course, in our own hemisphere. The good intentions were always there, but the language barrier that ensured a cultural gap and the misunderstandings that naturally came about from this dynamic left many Yanks with regrets, always remembering the refrain in Rudyard Kipling's Ballad of East and West, 
Oh, east is east and west is west, and never the twain shall meet. The Seiko Agreement was manipulated by Dai Li to dovetail with whatever secret plans he had going on on the side. And he had a lot of pots cooking on the stove with tight lids on that Miles had no idea about. And the main point of contention, though the Americans didn't find this out till it was too late, was exactly as I just said. Dai Li was supposed to be dedicating these resources, these arms and munitions, money, training, all the fancy gadgets and radio equipment. This was all supposed to be dedicated to fighting their common enemy, the Japanese occupying armies. But Dai Li, yeah, he had bigger fish to fry than the Japanese, and these were to use this American technology to root out enemies of the Chiang Kai-shek regime, with first and foremost being the communists. Dai Li's eternal rivals in the trade were the Chuns, Guo Fu and Li Fu. Traditionally, their Zhong Tong, or Central Statistics Bureau, acted in the role of the FBI of China. Though Dai Li crossed the line time and again, the Chans always had the upper hand in their secret police work. But now, with Uncle Sam, for Dai Li, it was one never-ending boxing day, and the Americans delivered. Besides all the spying and other types of gadgets that Dai was obsessed with, Miles brought in FBI agents, Secret Service agents, New York police who were trained in all kinds of deadly skills. A whole array of people were brought in to teach Dai Li everything they knew. Surveillance, interrogation techniques, intelligence evaluation. As long as it was being used for the war effort, the Americans couldn't have been more generous. Well, a lot of this training was in fact being used to trip up Japan and supply hard intelligence to the American military. But it was also being used for Dai Li's main war. And with all this help, Dai Li soon had a rival organization in place to challenge the Chun's CSB head-on. Dai was operating what was surely the most repressive and largest secret police force on the planet. They were a spy agency, a secret police, an FBI, a CIA, all rolled into one. And Dai Li was at the center of it all. And in his last years, he got to glom off the Americans for all they were worth and fight his secret war right under their noses. A secret this big was way too hard to keep quiet. It was one of those open secrets that no one spoke on the record about, but it didn't take that long for word to make it back to the U.S. State Department about the extent of what Dai had going on. This training was supposed to be used for military purposes, not for political purposes, you know, like supporting certain right-wing dictatorships. But that's exactly what was going on. Pretty soon, everyone from General Albert C. Wettermeyer on down started leaning on Miles to yank on Dai Li's chain and demand he stop using all these resources being supplied by the Americans for political purposes. But the Yanks, they were never a match for Dai Li. Not even Miles could control them. Dai's perfidy in using every drop of American good intentions to evil purposes could never be suppressed. Once these truckloads and truckloads of arms and munitions fell into Dai Li's hands, and it didn't get put to use fighting against Japan, it often went to engaging the communist new Fourth Army in battle. Dai Li's men, over the course of World War II, with Seiko, wittingly or unwittingly assisting them, left behind a mountain of corpses. Dai Li's most notorious prison, or torture chamber, was located at a place called Gula Shan, or Happy Valley. There's a revolutionary museum and memorial hall there today, in the western part of Chongqing. I read that the actual place where the worst atrocities were carried out was the former residence of the great Tang poet Bai Ju Yi. If you visit the museum, a lot of the horrors that went on there are on full display. This is out in the Sha Ping Ba district of suburban Chongqing. When the end came in late 1949 and Chongqing was just about to fall, the Nationalists destroyed all the Seiko files housed there at Gele Shan and evidence that might possibly, you know, cast them in a bad light, was destroyed. 
All the prisoners, well, most of them, they were all killed. And Seiko, again, unwittingly perhaps, provided the communists a treasure trove of fodder to be used as propaganda to shame the nationalists and the Americans. To all progressives and communists, Dai Li and all his atrocities, he was seen as the devil incarnate, the most representative personification of evil. But on the other hand, one could just as easily say the same thing about Kang Sheng, who acted as Dai Li's opposite on the communist side. Despite everything Dai Li was doing on the side during the last year of the war, from the time of D-Day in June 1944 to July 1945, Seiko units chalked up 23,000 kills, another 9,000 Japanese were wounded and hundreds captured. Seiko trained guerrillas blew up bridges, trains, 141 ships, 97 depots and warehouses. When you added it all up, Seiko had thrown a major wrench in the once well-oiled machine of the Japanese military in China. With all that heat on Dai Li, with all his abuses now out in the open, he began to develop a bad smell, and the Songs, both TV and Madame Jiang, they distanced themselves from him. But Jiang stuck with him, as Dai had always done for Jiang. When Wild Bill Donovan went to the Generalissimo and filed a complaint about Dai, Jiang angrily stood up for Dai and wouldn't back down to the OSS chief. Donovan had crossed swords with Dai Li early on, and the two had no love for one another. Dai prohibited Donovan from engaging in any spy work unless he knew about it. But Donovan was running agents and engaging in his own black ops, and this infuriated Dai every time he found out about it. In the eyes of Milton Miles, Donovan and the OSS were also an unwanted competitor operating on their turf. Dai would even launch a propaganda war against the OSS, making a lot of hay that Donovan was in cahoots with Mao. And not just the OSS, the so-called China Hands, John Patton Davies, uh, John S. Service, John Carter Vincent, and others, they all knew the truth about the KMT and the whole Jiang regime. But despite their reports, that often got buried. The U.S. government, thanks to the China lobby, was lined up solidly behind Chiang Kai-shek, and nothing was ever going to change that. And though we'll never know what good might have come out of giving up on Jiang and coming to terms early with Mao, all we can know for sure is the China hands were vilified for suggesting such a thing. And after McCarthy's February 1950 speech, the China hands were painted as commie simps who were trying to sell out America's ally, Chiang Kai-shek. Another major venture that Dai Li had going on during the 1940s was a smuggling empire that brought in obscene amounts of money into the KMT coffers. Drugs, foodstuffs, daily necessities of life, anything that could possibly fall off the back of a truck. Dai Li's operation dealt in it. And they competed head-to-head -head with the Japanese, who also had their own little smuggling operation going on. So great was the extent of the smuggling. In the last years of the war, customs duties were minuscule, which meant little revenue was getting into the treasury. The communists, who were still cooling their heels in Yen An, they would tell anyone who listened that all this American Lend-Lease equipment and supplies destined for Jiang was being used in the fight against them, not against Japan. This narrative that Jiang was using Uncle Sam to fight his fight against the communists had a lot of believers in the U.S., but not the ones who mattered. Wakeman called the nationalist government, quote, a tyrannical regime illegitimately ruled by secret policemen whom the Generalissimo could barely restrain, end quote. And in the countryside where more than 90% of the people lived, it was more of the same, like going back to the Taiping Rebellion. With this war of resistance against Japan, the peasantry had to once again take it on the chin, just as they had done during the degrading final decade of the Qing dynasty, then over the decade of warlordism, and now. The Chinese peasant, yeah, they always drew the short straw. December 1943, Dai Li came to the rescue of Chiang Kai-shek yet again when his Jintong agents uncovered a plot by several hundred officers in the military 
secretly attempting to overthrow Jiang while he was away at the Cairo conference. This was known as the Young General's Plot. It was snuffed out before. Anyone could do anything, and the leaders were duly executed. In January 1945, Ambassador Patrick J. Hurley came to Seiko headquarters in Happy Valley and was masterfully duped by Dai Li and Milton Miles, who assured Hurley, who, by the way, was intensely predisposed to sympathize with the Jiang government, that the OSS and these damn China hands, who Hurley also didn't care for, were getting their mitts on U.S. resources and funneling them to Mao and the communists. They got Hurley, another in a long line of wrong men at the wrong time, all worked up and just made a monkey out of him. So this hapless, self-important diplomat, just as Dai Li manipulated him to do, went straight to FDR and dumped all over the China hands and all of those who had been advocating to cooperate with Mao regarding fighting against Japan. If you recall from that series I did on John S. Service and all those China hands, including Colonel David Barrett, thanks to Ambassador Hurley, they all got yanked from power and their careers were disgraced. And General Wettermeyer sent out a direct order saying, Henceforth, no one was to collaborate or assist the communists in any way, shape, or form. Without the benefit of hindsight at the time, American diplomats and military figures did the best they could of a bad situation. Choosing between Mao and the communists, or Jiang and his hopeless regime, eh, not much of a choice, as history has shown us. By the way, the famous competition between General Joseph Stilwell and Jiang Kai-shek, well, we all remember, ended poorly for Vinegar Joe, and he was dismissed. Well, Dai Li played a co-starring role in that whole propaganda war. Well, as we know, as 1945 dawned, the Empire of Japan was running out of gas, figuratively speaking, that is. The dropping of the two atomic bombs on Japan not only put the exclamation point on the end of the war, it put an end to any hopes Chiang Kai-shek had been counting on of an invasion of American troops to finish off Japan on the Chinese mainland. And later on, once this was taken care of, in theory, Uncle Sam would conveniently have boots on the ground that would help finish off the communists, too. Talk about a major letdown. September 2nd, 1945, the formal instrument of surrender was signed aboard the USS Missouri in Tokyo Bay, and six months later, almost to the day, Seiko was formally shuttered. All Seiko records and materiel was handed over to Dai Li's Jintong. Milton Miles had stood squarely behind his man Dai Li from the outset and throughout Seiko's history in China. He willingly turned a blind eye to the abuses, and like the U.S. government, including the military establishment, they were in for a penny and in for a pound with the nationalists. Despite the best efforts of such sacred cows as General George C. Marshall and others, everyone knew what was going to happen on the Chinese mainland once World War II ended. Stalin wasn't subtle at all about all his grand designs for the Soviet Union. And so began the Cold War that George Orwell warned about in 1945. Now, more than ever, the folks back in Washington believed it was critical to back Chiang Kai-shek. Between August and October 1945, with the war over, Jiang called a top-level meeting to discuss the matter of reorganizing the massive security complex. Dai Li saw this coming and knew that, even after all the dedication and loyalty he had showed Jiang going back to the 1920s, he was as expendable as the next guy. Thanks in no part to his enemies, of which he had a few, his empire was clearly going to be broken up. And though there wasn't any talk yet of holding him accountable for the plethora of abuses and atrocities he committed, Dai Li knew that Jiang was going to cut him off at the knees. Prior to the meeting, Dai had flown all over China to talk to key military and political figures to enlist their support in whatever the new arrangement would end up being. On March 16th, 1946, after meetings in Beijing, Dai flew to Tianjin for more talks. Then the next day, on March 17th, 
he flew to Qingdao, and at 9.45 in the morning, Dai, eight others, and the flight crew flew to Shanghai. And as the plane started its descent into Shanghai, storms were too intense, and the pilot decided to divert the flight to the west of the city in the direction of Nanjing. But the weather in Nanjing turned out to be no better. Despite all that, the pilot radioed flight control at 1.13 p.m., and announced he was going to attempt a landing. And then in Jiangning, just south of Nanjing and east of the Yangtze River, the plane crashed through a bunch of trees and exploded into the side of a mountain. By the time rescuers made it to the downed plane, all that remained was the wreckage and the charred corpses inside. And then about three nanoseconds after the death of Dai Li was confirmed, the rumors began to circulate about who was responsible for arranging this. I read that they flew Dai Li's main squeeze, Chen Hua, down to Nanjing to identify Dai Li's remains. She had supposedly been with Dai on his final evening. The gold teeth and one other distinguishing feature confirmed what everyone already knew. So much of these last 24 hours before Dai took that fateful flight have been debated. In the end... There was no smoking gun pointing to anyone in particular. Just bad luck. The crash was chalked up to bad weather that caused that plane to go down just south of Nanjing. One theory claimed someone put a bomb on board the flight. Kang Sheng would have been the most likely suspect to arrange for this if that was the case. He certainly had the assets in place to carry out such an act. Maybe it was the Americans... They were done with Dai Li. He had served his purpose. They might have done something to make this happen. Jiang certainly could have arranged it. It was known to all that Jiang was going to dismantle Dai's empire. And a guy who had as many enemies as Dai Li did, well, he knew everyone had their knives out for him. Who caused the plane to go down? No one knows for sure. But it did. And the hit to the Jintong was catastrophic. At the time of Dai Li's death, there were over 100,000 Jintong operatives in place serving in civilian, military, and policing roles. There were hundreds of thousands of military troops that they had some degree of control over. A lot of the power that Jiang Kai-shek wielded, he did so through the good offices of the Jintong. One other huge hit to the post-Dai Li Secret Service Empire... He didn't write stuff down. He managed the entire operation with his network of relationships and a reservoir of secrets that only he knew about. And would die out of the picture so suddenly, it punched a massive hole in the entire management of the MSB. Plus, without the specter of Dai Li, people didn't necessarily lose their fear of the MSB, but they didn't look at it in the same way. While he was alive, Dai Li made sure to keep any scent of factionalism or MSB infighting beneath the surface. He did this through the force of his will and in the personal relationships he had with the tight-knit circle of deputies he had working for him, all from his days going back to the Wampoa Military Academy. And those who sought to replace Dai, even in a much downsized version of the MSB, started hotly contending for the top spot. And this power struggle ended up just decimating the Nationalist Secret Service to the extent that they were no longer any match for what the Communists had by 1946. Mao was said to have uttered that Dai Li's sudden death moved up the Communists' chance of defeating the Nationalists in a civil war by 10 or even 20 years. Dai Li's sudden departure was an unmitigated disaster for the nationalist government and their chances of coming out on top in the civil war that was sure to erupt. December 1945 to January 1947 was the period where the clueless American negotiators were engaging in negotiations to bring the CCP and KMT together under one government. At the time, there existed no greater lost cause in the world than that. Mao knew it, and so did Jiang. The Americans found out only too late. After a very messy shakeout period, 
Dai's old friend from his hometown of Jiangshan, Mao Renfeng, took over the Jintong. He had always been one of Dai's closest lieutenants, and they went back a long way. Following the surrender of Japan, Jiang made it the first order of business to round up and punish all traders who collaborated or profited by the Japanese. Jintong agents overzealously went after everyone they could, even those with the most tenuous of links to Japan. No one was safe during this short reign of terror, and fortunes were made by aggressive and corrupt Jintong agents threatening those who were suspect and forcing them to cough up their gold, jewels, and anything of value to escape their precarious situation. In August 1946, Jiang Kai-shek and Madame Jiang paid their respects to Dai Li at his temporary resting place. Jiang had arranged for an elaborate tomb to be constructed for Dai near the Sun Yat-sen mausoleum, east of Nanjing. Milton Miles, loyal to Dai to the very end, attended the entombment ceremony, but not on an official basis. He came as a private citizen. And believe me, when the communists took Nanjing on April 23, 1949, Dai Li's tomb was ransacked and desecrated. And though he probably wasn't any worse than his counterparts in the CCP spying and secret police organizations, he became a perennial boogeyman to point to by CCP propagandists to malign the KMT and Chiang Kai-shek. So let's bring this little three-part overview to a close. Dai Li was called many things. Chiang Kai-shek's saber, Chiang Jie-shi, the Pei Jian, China's global bodyguard, China's Himmler, China's most mysterious man, most feared man, most dreaded man, all of these nicknames accurately described him. Had the nationalists endured on the mainland, and had it been the communists who fled in defeat, who knows? Maybe Dai Li might have been given a pass, and it would have been Kang Sheng and the CCP security apparatus who got the ultimate vilification. By any accounts, even in his day, Dai was a horrible person who personally killed many a perceived and real enemy. And those he smote with orders he gave to others is a large number that we could only estimate. So that's going to be it. Thanks once again for listening. Hey, remember, CHP Premium, if you'd like to enjoy lovely ad-free listening, if you'd care to support me or show me some kindness, head on over to the teacup.media website and click on support. There's a number of convenient ways to show me your largesse and appreciation. This is Laszlo Montgomery signing off once again from the City of Night, Los Angeles, California. Please consider coming back next time for what could be another exciting episode of the China History Podcast.